Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this uh, beautiful Monday at, at two. Um, we're here for the Business Adaptability Lessons Learned in a Pandemic from St. Cloud Area's Independent Healthcare Providers uh, is the name of our presentation today. Um, and we'll be uh, hearing from a couple of different people. And I do just want to do some quick housekeeping, Zoom housekeeping tools. I'm sure you've uh, all heard this stuff before as you've been on different virtual meetings. But um, very quickly, we do ask that you mute yourself or keep yourself muted during the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions and you don't want to forget them or just put any questions you have into the chat. I will be monitoring um, that and we can get those questions answered. Uh, as uh, as we go along or at, at the end of the presentation, um, but we will make sure to get those questions answered. Um, so just feel free to put those in the chat. Um, if you need anything else, um, certainly again uh, in the chat, go ahead and ask it or you can ask it directly to me, any of those questions as we go. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to our president, Teresa Bonin to introduce our panelists today. Thanks, Laura. And for most of you, you know me, Teresa Bonin, um, president of the chamber, and it's wonderful to be here with you today and to be able to present this, <clears throat> this topic. Um, earlier, we presented kind of our uh, uh, a presentation that was hosted by Centricare. And at that time, Dr. Weldon came to me and said, you know, the experiences of our independent healthcare providers in the area may have been different and, and could really lend some additional information and light to what already has been said. So we were very excited to have him pull this together and put the work in to bring um, our, our guest panelists together today. And so if, if you are on um, you know, the whole screen, you can see everybody, but if you put it on speaker screen, then you'll, you'll go through the panelists as they, um, as they speak. And our, our panelists are Dr. Derek Welding, Wel Weldon from CDI, um, Dr. Julie Anderson from Simplicity Health. And if you aren't, um, if you aren't familiar with Simplicity Health, I was fortunate enough to do a Grow Minnesota call there and learn about it. It's a really exciting model um, and one to, to learn about, I think, that will that is and will remain very relevant for the future of healthcare. Bill Warzella from St. Cloud Orthopedics and Darthi, Darcy Nagorski from St. Cloud Surgical Center. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to do this. I'm really interested to hear what you are going to tell us today um, and to kind of put this together with how COVID is, is um, really doing to our entire community right now. So for right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Julie Anderson to start and then you guys can just uh, um, tra transition through your presentation and we'll have questions at the end. So thank you, Dr. Julie. You know, and I think actually, Teresa, I'll, I'll start yeah. with just a quick introduction and then I'll hand it off to Julie Perfect. from there. So. Perfect. Sounds thank good. you. So, and uh, thank you so much. I'm uh, Derek Weldon, Medical Director and Radiologist at the Center for Diagnostic Imaging here in St. Cloud. And on behalf of our panel, I'd like to thank the St. Cloud Chamber uh, for inviting us to speak and uh, for their support of small businesses like ours in the community. Um, our panel today is comprised of representatives from four independent healthcare uh, practices in Minnesota. We also formed the organizing committee for a group called Central Minnesotans for Healthcare Independence, or CMHI, which is a coalition that came together last year and is comprised of medical providers, business leaders, and concerned citizens in Central Minnesota. Um, you can cue the first slide if you would. Our mission at CMHI is to inform and educate people in central Minnesota that they should have the right to choose their medical provider and also to support policies on the local, state, and federal levels that foster independence, competition, and cost effectiveness in healthcare. So at this point, I'd like to, uh, you can switch slides if you would, um, just briefly introduce our panelists. And Teresa's already 
introduce those, so I'll, I'll uh, pass it on to Julie Anderson and she can, can start from there. Thanks, Derek. Um, so I'm a family physician. I've been here in the community uh, for about 16 years. And two years ago, I left corporate medicine uh, because I believe that the best medical care happens when decisions are made between a patient and their physician without intrusion of third parties, you know, whether that be administrative, insurance. Um, so I built a model uh, that I'll tell you about in a minute um, to, to offer uh, different options for, for patients in the community. I also believe in the philosophy that many small businesses have that um, competition leads to greater effort. And um, especially when you're talking about primary care, since we're often referred to as the gatekeepers, um, you know, if we make the referrals to specialists, we order tests, we order labs. Um, so it's really critical for you to have somebody that's not beholden uh, necessarily to, to a third party when you're making those decisions. And, and a lot of those are you know, very personal decisions that you as a patient need to, um, to make or as a business owner to make on behalf of your employees, whether it's looking at a different insurance product or what have you. So um, that's why, you know, uh, we at this clinic have, have really uh, thought it important to be part of this uh, independent provider group to um, tell people that we're out, out here and that we, we offer um, similar services and we have great value. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the kind of value that we think we provide as, as independent primary care. Um, even though I practice medicine, I'm still probably firstly a small business mindset. Um, my colleague and I share in the frustrations and the worries and the joys of owning a business, um, you know, particularly during COVID. Uh, we've had similar, I'm sure, struggles that, that many of you have, um, but, but again, um, understanding the value that, that in terms of healthcare we bring to central Minnesota. First of all, we're quite nimble. We were the, you know, I'm proud to say we're the first people to offer um, COVID tests and car visits uh, before the big uh, groups uh, offered them. And we were the first to provide primary care visits electronically uh, when Medicare and insurance allowed them to be offered. We were nimble because there's two two physicians at our office and you know we looked up uh, okay what are the rules and we can use doxy.me they suspended hipaa for a period of time so we can now use uh, facetime with our patients i'm hoping that the uh, those e-visit services will continue i think there's enough pressure in the future to still allow that to happen i had a patient who um, he's an essential guy that, that works down in Wilmer and he's a diabetic and he just needed to check in with me and he did it all on FaceTime. He was driving his big bulldozer and he stopped and got out of his car and was able to show me with his iPad, hey, this is where I work. And his employer was happy because he didn't have to leave the job site. The patient was happy because he didn't have to drive an hour to see me. And it, it's a win-win scenario for all of the, all of us. So to look at some silver linings that COVID has provided, I think is, is um, useful. Um, here at our clinic, we never closed our doors or turned away patients um, during COVID because we felt really confident that we could see them safely um, if they really needed to be seen, primarily to keep them out of the ER and the hospital. Um, we saved an elderly woman who lived alone uh, from getting in the hospital because of a, a urinary tract infection. She was so afraid to leave the, the house and we encouraged her to come. Even though she had a fever, it was not COVID. It was just a bad bladder infection. Um, I also saw a new patient uh, who couldn't get in to their provider um, because they're only doing electronic visits and she had a throat mass and I was fortunate to get her into CDI like the very next day, got her biopsied. She has thyroid cancer and now she's down at Mayo getting that removed. But um, I think those are the things where we advocate on, on behalf, just like all, all small businesses, you advocate on behalf of your consumers. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention that, you know, we provide a lot of cost value, I think, to the community. Um, 
uh, and as Teresa had mentioned, you know, we accept most insurance, but we were also first in, uh, to offer um, something called direct primary care, where we offer a monthly membership fee that covers all that we do in the clinic. And it helps people uh, who struggle, you know, without insurance, which may be um, happening more with COVID, or that have really, really high deductible plans that they just never meet. It, it just, um, really is important to me that patients should never fear their medical bill more than their illness. And um, in fact, we were mandated in primary care by the Minnesota legislature a few years ago to um, post comparative costs uh, for our clinic. So you can actually go on our website and find out what the cost would be for an average office visit and compare that to other health systems in the community where typically um, half as expensive as larger health systems. Um, and with health partners closing soon, uh, I think you all probably know are aware of that. Um, you know, we're going to be asking our community to support some of our small businesses uh, in healthcare so that we can, you know, keep competition in the marketplace and keep our quality uh, high and our costs as low as we can. Um, I, I think. Um, I think there's definitely a niche for that. Um, I think uh, you know we've done well enough that we're actually excited to to note that we're uh, breaking ground on a new office building on the south side of town next week. Uh, so um, look for that soon. Maybe we'll have to have a chamber event there. So um, anyway, with that, I'll I'll pass it back to to Dr. Weldon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Julie. I want to uh, just uh, briefly touch on a few um, uh, a few items that uh, kind of get to the heart of why why some of this is so pertinent, especially in light of COVID and in light of health partners uh, leaving the market. Um, what we've seen locally and and what we're seeing around the country is the continued rise of large health systems. And with that rise, um, and this is something you see consistently. Um, written about across the country is it tends to make it harder for patients to choose their providers. It tends to decrease access to both primary and specialty care, and it increases costs to patients and businesses of all sizes. With that further consolidation, those are some of the effects you get. And in this age of COVID, in this age of needing to be nimble, um, needing to be cost effective, um, it's you know it's especially important now that we that we concentrate on keeping those um, keeping the independent uh, medical community strong as an option as a competitive um, option in our community, and with that um, I'd like to uh, to pass it on to uh, Bill Warzala, who's the uh, administrator at um, uh, Saint Paul Orthopedics. Oh, Bill, you're muted. Yep, there we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I muted myself. Um, th thanks, Derek. Um, as you said, I'm the administrator at St. Claude Orthopedics. I've been here about 16 years, and, and in those 16 years, have seen, you know, lots of uh, changes in the in the healthcare environment, uh, both here locally and nationally. Um, a lot of it having to do, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, with consolidations in healthcare. Um, as Julie said earlier. You know, St. Cloud Orthopedics, like Simplicity Health, is, is a local business. Um, unlike Julie, who's been around two years, we've been here 65 years, providing um, care uh, to, to the community. Um, you know, our physicians and our employees, we have currently have 21 physicians and, and about 150 employees who are all, all part of the community, all active in the community, and, and both, you know, corporately and, and individually, uh, we support many local organizations, um, both, both financially and, and by giving our time. And, and I think, you know, in a, in a community like St. Cloud, in the St. Cloud area, that's, that's very important. You want, you know, businesses to be invested in the community. And I, and I think you really get that from, from independence. Um, you know, touching on, on COVID and, and the impact it, it had on our clinic, uh, like, like most businesses, uh, you know, we saw a huge, significant drop in, in our business, both um, electively by by us not not seeing 
those patients who weren't, uh, who weren't critical, who didn't need to be seen. Um, you know, like Julie being a, a small organization, you know, our executive committee would meet two, three times a week um, to see what was changing. As you all know, things were changing, you know, weekly, daily, almost hourly. Uh, and, and by being a smaller, uh, more versatile organization, we, we could address those changes. Uh, you know, we, we, we implemented telehealth, you know, as soon as we could as well. Uh, you know, to date, you know, we've seen over 500 visits through telehealth. Um, we, we, within a two-day time frame, implemented a mobile parking lot check-in system where our patients could actually get a text in their cars telling them that they could come into our clinic to be seen. Uh, so while it's been a very challenging time, it's also been a very exciting time to, to see the, the changes uh, that, that have taken place in our clinic. Um, with that, I, I also want to talk a little bit more about the importance of independent clinics, independent health care. Um, you know, while, while health systems are very important to a community, you know, independent providers are, are as, as important as, as, the, as the systems. Um, you know, we have, we have more freedom to perhaps give patients all treatment options to, revert, to refer patients to any provider or facility where we think they can get their, their best, uh, best care you know, without any pressure to, to do things a, a certain way. Um, you know, in, in fact, many insurance companies are trying to steer healthcare away from the health systems to independent and freestanding um, clinics be, because, of, because of the cost. Um, you know, the, the cost, uh, as, as again, both Julie and Derek alluded to, you know, can be up to 50% less at a freestanding or independent center than it can within a health system. Um, you know, along those same lines, a couple of years ago, we, we implemented our OrthoDirect, which is an urgent care clinic for, for those same reasons. It's, it's quicker, easier access for the patients at a significantly lower cost. Um, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we try and, and treat our patients, you know, we try and do what we do best. Um, and, you know, we, we try not to do everything. You know, we, we are, I guess I can announce it now, currently working with CDI uh, on, a, on a project to, to create some joint imaging facilities. And we're really excited about, about what's going to happen there. Um, and, and I guess the last thing I, I want to say is, you know, a, a survey in 2018 showed that 78% of physicians sometimes, often, or usually experience feelings of stress and burnout. Those same surveys show that physicians in private practices, independent groups, are much more resilient to that burnout because they've retained their decision-making capabilities and they feel much more engaged in the success of their practice. So, you know, we are a, a big advocate of, of independent practices. I think they're very important um, and, and again, provide us a, a nimbleness. I'm gonna, Turn it over to Darcy here in just a second, but, but want to, to say along those same lines that working with the St. Cloud Surgical Center, within 30 days of reopening for elective procedures, we were able to get through our total backlog of about 200 cases of, of patients. And that was a real credit to the ability of the St. Cloud Surgical Center to adapt and, and uh, work with us to get that done. So. Thanks, Darcy. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Good transition. Um, I'm, again, Darcy Nagorski. I'm the administrator at the St. Cloud Surgical Center. Um, similar to everyone else who spoke here, we are an independent outpatient surgery center. Um, we're predominantly owned by local surgeons. Um, about 80% of our, our partnership is owned by the local surgeons. Um, and we've been in the community for almost 50 years. So longstanding um, history here. We have 11 operating rooms and about 150 staff. Um, so we, we really run as almost a small um, hospital to some degree on many days. Um, we have experienced a ton of stuff since March 16th. Um, March 16th, I'm just gonna kind of go through a little time frame of what happened here. And 
Um, in, looking back, I'm extremely proud of um, our leadership team, our physicians, um, everyone came together and um, in a highly, um, ASCs are very high, highly regulated um, on many fronts. Um, so not only had we, did we have that to deal with, but then what the government was also um, implementing on a higher level, um, even beyond our regulations. Um, so on Monday, uh, March 16th, um, our, our, you could call it our board uh, met because we were, we were starting to feel the pressure. Um, we realized we were not, we were gonna need to close the clinic at some point or the center. Um, we still felt on that Monday that we could very much safely do cases. Um, but then the pressure was mounting, um, and then that's when um, Governor Wall spoke on March 19th and put in and signed Executive Order 20-09, which directed the delay of inpatient and outpatient elective surgeries. Um, whether you were in a hospital or in an ASC, it didn't matter. And that in, that in itself was an interesting uh, situation to go through um, because in that order, it stated that not, I'm just going to kind of read it for, for, verbatim. Uh, non-essential surgery or a procedure that can be delayed without undue risk to current and future health of a patient. Um, those things that were examples in there to help determine the need was threat to a patient's life if surgery is not performed, threat of permanent dysfunction of an extremity or organ, including teeth and jaws, and risk of metastases of, or progression of staging. Well, some people might say, well, you're in elective surgery. Why, why would you, how would you fit any of those? Um, you know, we were very cognizant of, we didn't know what we didn't know at that time. We didn't know where things were going. We needed, we, we needed to proceed cautiously. Um, already on Sunday, March 15th, um, I had a call um, from the hospital to say, hey, can we, can we connect? We just, we wanna be on the same page as far as um, uh, supply inventory goes, as far as safety, um, our, our personal protection equipment. Um, ventilators, you know, just starting to be in dialogue with them. And we stayed in dialogue with the hospital on a weekly basis um, up until about the beginning of May when we were about ready to reopen. Um, we, know, we knew the delays were designed to, you know, decrease the chance of transmission and allow for our health system to prepare for inpatient and out ICU bed capacity. Um, you know, we were, we felt good on our PPE supply, um, but we had to continually stay on top of it. Um, we did have close conversations with the hospital to say um, we would definitely act as an overflow surgery center. Um, we, were, we would offer up staff if we needed to. Um, we would definitely offer up our supplies if we needed to. Um, you know, thankfully, we just never got to that point. Um, we weren't even really close to that point. Um, so for two weeks, we were closed completely um, until April 3rd. Um, and then we reopened for what was considered under the executive order with, with urgent um, emergent electives. Um, we, we were in constant communication on a daily basis with our medical director. Our leadership team was in the office almost every day trying to figure out, um, we were essential. We weren't doing patient contact at that point in time, um, but we were trying to figure out how to do this all safely. Um, again, even though elective, it doesn't mean that it, is, it isn't essential. Um, to Bill's point, we do a lot of total joint patients. We do about 400 in a year. Close to, we're closing on 500 this year. Um, many of these are in, in extreme pain. They've probably been in pain for quite some time, um, and they can't walk very well. And, and you can delay that, and many of them that we, we did delay, um, but is it good for them is another, is another thing. Um, th there's people that even have shoulder issues or knee issues and, and the functionality of those extremities can affect if they can work or not. Um, and so then you try to judge that with putting it into the executive orders. I know for a lot of surgeons was, was a dilemma because um, they were definitely trying to treat their patients and they were almost stuck in a position um, that was gonna get judged. I think our surgeons did a great job um, they know their patients, um, and, and they worked through um, being cognizant of the executive order, but also making sure these patients could be treated. Um, as I mentioned, we're highly regulated. Medicare, Department of Health, we have industry agencies that we are accredited under. Um, so at this time, we were constantly reviewing CDC, Department of Health. Um, we're, we are a part of a larger surgery center as well. Um, we were working with them on the regulations. Um, and 
so at that point um, on April 3rd, we put in screening protocols for all staff that was coming in to work on these two days a week. Um, we, we had new protocols for um, how we begin a surgery, how we end a surgery, because you are intubating and extubating patients. There's air exchange things we had to work on with our HVAC and our rooms. Um, everything I felt was down to the second on how we had to proceed with caution as we went in and out of a surgery. Um, we had a lot of policy changes. Um, we determined some cases that even though they were urgent, they were not safe to do at that time. Um, those things are dentals, many of the ENT cases, some colonoscopies. Um, so we worked through a lot of change during that time. Our staff was extremely fle flexible because they might have come in on a Tuesday and not worked till the next Tuesday and policy had changed by the next week. So they, we all had to work in an environment of being extremely nimble, but remembering the precautions along the way. Um, then we proceeded through April. Um, we felt we were, we were becoming a lot more confident in what we were doing. Um, even though things were changing throughout the country, um, here at least we weren't seeing the surge, at least in our community. Um, again, we were staying in touch with the hospital to make sure where they were at with inpatients as well as ICU beds, COVID cases. Um, you know, so we were closed from March 19th till May 13th. We delayed over 600 cases. Um, at that point, we started to have a growing concern at the beginning of May as to when the governor would open back up. Um, from all indications, we were seeing at least locally, it might not have been the same thing in Ramsey or Hennepin County, but at least here we felt we could safely open. But again, we were under the state guidance on that. Um, we were concerned about how we were going to get these patients all back in, how quickly, um, how do we do it with 70 surgeons, and how do you determine who's more important than the other? That was probably our biggest concern that we wanted to work closely. And Bill knows we worked very closely with their surgeons. Um, at this point, patients have been waiting, you know, since end of February, early March. Um, in our community, there's a lot of um, people who work in farms, do farming. They want to get their surgeries in in April or even March so they can get back out in the fields. Um, we didn't know what people's appetite would be to come back. And we didn't know if some people are just going to delay. We felt extremely comfortable by the beginning of May because we'd been doing cases throughout April that we knew we could come back safely. Um, what we needed to do then though was step up our um, safety measures even more because now we needed to get back with all the cases, all the ENT cases, all the dental, um, anything aerosol generated, we knew we needed to get, get back to. And really we, we kept doing the same things we were doing, but we did add mandatory COVID testing pre-op, um, pre which, um, was a huge undertaking in itself because we weren't sending them anywhere. We really had no, um, it was best for us to do that in house, even though we have had good options. We've worked with Julie on some of that for patients because it's a good option, but because of the turnaround time and trying to set them up for pre pre COVID test as well as our pre surgical COVID test, as well as their surgery, there's a timing to that. Um, thankfully, because of the larger company that we're a part of from a general partner, we were able to do a nationwide, um, uh, partnership with Quest. So all of our nurses were handling the testing in-house. Um, we had to figure out how quickly, because there's also a time frame between you don't want that too far out before surgery, but we needed to offer enough time um, as well to get the test back. Um, so all of our patients um, do have a test. We've tested so far about 1,300 asymptomatic patients. Keep in mind, we're still screening these patients with our nurses. So if anyone um, has had exposure, anyone is having symptoms, they're already weeded out. So these are all asymptomatic patients. We've, t we've had about 1,300 we've tested, and seven of those 13 um, have come back positive. So we feel in itself we've done uh, an amazing um, study, you could say, because these patients are anywhere from two years old to 80-some. Um, they're in a geographic territory from 120 miles to 150 miles from St. Cloud. Um, I think that goes to show that we can, can do these surgeries safely as long as we take the precautions um, when only seven asymptomatic out of 1,300 have come back positive. Uh, the other safety measures, of course, is we have mandatory masks for all of our staff. Um, we don't have any escorts in the lobby except for pediatric patient escorts. Um, we screen all staff that come in, you know, temperature symptoms. 
Um, we work very closely with staff if they're not feeling well and how to manage that or if they've had potential positive exposure. Um, that in itself is a daily um, time, time consuming system. Um, but we feel we're ready for anything else that might happen in the future. Um, patients don't have to enter the hospital where there might be positive cases if there's, if there's any surge in the, in the future. Um, you know, we, will, we do watch the resurgence continually both at the county and the hospital. Um, and we feel very confident. Um, the Department of Health is out doing spot surveys right now. Um, so we need to expect one any day that they're unannounced. Um, but we have our COVID plan in place. Essentially, our COVID plan was put together from March 16th till May 13th. Um, our plan was building upon itself on a daily basis. Um, so in closing, I just, you know, want to state, you know, I think we take it for granted that, that most people should be able to figure out how to get back to work. Um, but we forget that there's so many people um, online right now for work. Um, many businesses don't have employees back in. But I really feel that businesses going back to work could, could um, take advice from places like essential workers, like all of us that have spoke here. Um, we've had to figure out how to do it. Um, there is a safe way to do it. Um, I think if we can do it, I think most any entity can do it. Um, but it takes time to sit down with your leadership team or the right people within the organization um, and put the policies in place and put the procedures in place. Um, I don't think there's a need to reinvent the wheel in a lot of places because the essential groups that have done it um, have figured it out. And um, even down to the churches, I've been amazed at going to church and what, and what you can do in the church and safely go to church. Um, so we just, we really learned we had to be very, very nimble um, because we're our own entity and can um, decide on things um, within the safety policies um, of what the guidance was by the government. Um, we knew we could do it. And um, the, these cases need to be done. Um, yes, they're elective. Um, but they're, but they're certainly very important to get done. And that's it. Great, thank you. Any, uh, uh, at this point, I will open it up for questions. If anyone had any questions um, and they didn't put it in the chat, feel free to unmute yourself and, and we'll just ask those one at a time right now. If anyone has anything. Um, you know, one you know, thing I, I'd like to, go ahead, Teresa, sorry. I would just like to know what, what your estimation is on the future need of additional closures um, and how that impacts the, the overall medical environment that, that we're in. And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but it, that's part of it. And I know at the chamber, part of our dilemma right now as we plan for next year and how to budget and what to do is there is no certainty of anything. So how do you plan as a medical facility whenever you're faced with that kind of a, kind of a future or at least immediate future? Maybe I'll take a stab at this one at this one first. I think what Darcy alluded to is is important that um, the screening process that goes on for patients prior to them um, hitting the door is really important and reducing the risk, um, even if we do see an increase in um, cases in the population, having a robust uh, screening process like that really does decrease the risk and i I can't see I can't see us shutting down to the extent that we did initially. I mean, I think, I think the things on the outpatient basis are going to stay open more than they were initially because of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, there may be, you know, there, there may be a stay at home order that comes back. There may be something like that, but in, but in terms of clinics completely shutting down, um, I, I have a hard time imagining that scenario. I think we'll stay open and use the lessons that we've learned. So. And Derek, I'll, I'll follow up on that, and I, I agree 100% with you. Um, you know, like like everyone else, you know, we have put the testing policies in place. You know, we, we screen all of our patients when they come in. You know, we require every patient to wear a mask, and, and you know, credit to our patients and 
you know, between our, our clinic side and our, our therapy side, we can see four to 500 patients a day. We have truly only had a handful who have balked at our, at our policies. So, you know, congratulations to this community. You know, you can't turn on the news without people seeing people go ballistic by requiring, being required to wear a mask. And, and this community has, has done a, has done a great job. Um, and I don't, I don't see that changing. I think these masking and screening things are going to be in place um, for, I think, significantly longer than probably, certainly that people want. Um, but it is a relatively simple tool that by all appearances is very effective in, in preventing the spread. So, you know, our, our models, Teresa, to, to follow up on you, you know, show us, you know, continuing to, to stay open and to function, but there's always that, you know, what if, I mean, what if there is a, a another big surge, you know, will, th will things change? Will things get shut down? Possibly, but I think you're going to see that, uh, that clinics are going to have to, you know, continue to function, um, you know, <laughs> You know, we're, we're following very closely what's going to happen with high school sports because in our business, for, for good or, you know, bad for them, good for us, um, high school sports, you know, present a lot of patients to St. Cloud Orthopedics. Um, you know, we, we shut down our urgent, after hours urgent care clinic that, you know, generally ran from 8 to 8 and, and 8 to noon on Saturdays. And we're just running at eight to five right now because people aren't doing as many things. You know, people aren't, we're not seeing those injuries that, that we've seen in the past. And, and again, a lot of that does relate to what happens at the high school level. And if, you know, high school football opens up on Friday nights, you know, we'll be open on Saturday mornings. If not, I can't promise we'll be open on Saturday mornings. I would also say that, um, you know, we've had a few months under our belt now to um, be able to anticipate uh, some of the, um, the symptoms. We, we know how to di relatively diagnose it. Um, we are supposed to have uh, point of care testing available in the fall. I've been told by my supplier that we should have those uh, 15 minute rapid turnaround tests um, that are PCR like the swabs um, in our offices by September. And I think that'll be a game changer. They've just been trying to ramp up production on these tests, but um, if you could have a point of care honestly, I think that's the only way to um, help the schools out because uh, if you've got a kid that tests positive in a classroom, or maybe they're, they're, they just have a fever, let's say, you don't know if it's COVID or you don't know if it's a, you know, uh, just another run-of-the-mill virus until you test them. And currently our, our turnaround times are up to six days because a lot of the tests are being, um, you know, shifted to the southern states. So until we ramp up production of those uh, tests, we're um, we're going to struggle a little bit, but I'm hopeful that that by this fall it'll it'll be a different level. And I would also add that, you know, we focus so much on this COVID, and and we it's a it's a obviously a new disease, and we're still learning, and and there's some devastating consequences for some, but we can't overlook the needs of the um, other people with other, you know, potentially life-threatening or, or just limb-threatening or, or just, you know, in morbidity sense, just what, how that's affecting their, their lifestyle and, and every life is important. Every, um, every medical ailment is important. So how do you weigh uh, some of those questions when in the context of a pandemic? I, I, that's what um, I've struggled with a lot uh, seeing some of these folks that that uh, hold off on getting something done. Uh, you had mentioned Darcy about waiting on hips, and uh, my husband's an ophthalmologist, and you know people that can't see, and you you call it a non-essential surgery, but for that person, it's darn essential when they can't mm -hmm. see and they can't drive, and um, 
you know, those, those kind of things um, are important, just like we label jobs non-essential, you know, uh, uh, health, every job is essential to me, so. And I would just lastly say that to, to my point earlier, I mean, I don't know when could be a safer time to have surgery. Um, I mean, and if we haven't figured it out yet, then shame on us. But I know at least in our center, we have. Um, our staff understand the routine. Uh, they, you know, they, they worked in this environment. They, they know the environment. Yeah, we've had to add, add some extra um, policies around it. Um, but um, I, to, and to Julie's point, I think that was the saddest thing is to see that who's, who's to say, um, and, and personally, I don't think that should be the government, but who's to say one surgery is more um, essential than the other? It's, it's just not, it's not good. And um, it causes more disruption than, than there should be um, and more anxiety. Um, and, and if you've, if you've been following the process all along and been and learning from it, you should be ready to go. And, and yes, we have to watch the surge in the hospital. We have to be prepared for capacity in the beds. And, 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 and the hospital sits in a different situation as far as how they run their ORs because they, they do have to have some capacity for, for beds. But I think you still have to weigh, um, you have to weigh that out and make sure you're still being able to get patients in for, for those other things as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, another question for the group uh, is, what are you seeing in terms of COVID cases in the St. Cloud area? Are, is it trending that it's, it's going up, it's growing, it's shrinking, those numbers are staying sa stable? What are you experiencing? I'll take that one, because um, I keep track of Stearns County. Uh, very closely and uh, posted actually on our Facebook page, our graph, just to, to keep things in perspective, because I know there's a lot of angst and, and worry with this, but um, in, in Stearns County, we had a big spike uh, maybe two months ago with the meatpacking plants that got us in the hundreds a day for a little short period of time. And then we were almost down, well, we were down to zero or, or a handful a day. And I think we've had just over the last uh, week or two, up to maybe 20 a day um, with the, a couple of um, bars uh, and I think restaurants that, that opened. A lot of those uh, kids, you know, college kids that have been kind of at home and uh, there's only so long they can social distance, <laughs> you know, completely. And, um, and how do you make that safe for that uh, age group? I think less important as the case numbers, which is what we've really all kind of focused in on, is, and is important, um, but probably deaths and hospitalizations are the most important in my mind. Um, and the morbidity, you know, the consequences of having the illness, which fortunately are pretty, you know, pretty small. Um, so it's important to kind of keep track of those. And I think we're at like, one or two in the hospital right now. And uh, um, I know from personally at our clinic, we've seen 30 or 40 over the last couple of months. And I can tell you everybody survived. I've had ages 30 to 87 and uh, had one, two people hospitalized. They're both out of the hospital now. That's my perspective. Mm -hmm. okay. And I've seen a number of, of patients who've recovered um, also who've uh, who've come in for procedures after the fact and uh you know some who were quite sick uh with it um but again varying varying degrees of um of severity uh with their illness but it's it is positive it's a positive trend in Stearns County for sure that we don't have the uh, the numbers hospitalized that we did before and um just and a, and a little bit more on the numbers too another thing um to look for um you know there's been there's been talk of you know the the number of cases that are being detected are going up because the te the the testing capacity is going up and that's and that is true but once we reach a point where our testing capacity is high and that sort of plateaus then then you look for the percent positivity so you look of those x number of tests a day how what percent of those are positive so that's that's what they're looking for on a on a regional or even community basis if you're starting to get clusters of higher percent positive 
test when you've already got a baseline level of high testing. So you've got a, a numbers that are kind of moving in opposite in, in different directions, but that's one that they watch for also. So we have what's called the IFR and the CFR. The, the CFR is the case fatality rate. So that's the number of cases that are known that are positive. And then we, you know, you divide the, the death rate by the total cases. And that's the scary number that's, you know, usually in the couple of percent, it's even coming down. But the more important number is the IFR, the infection fatality rate, which is probably orders of magnitude. I, I've seen anywhere from 10 to 70 times uh, the, the number. It's all those cases that we never diagnosed that, you know, um, ha were infected. And they think that at, at minimum, it's 10 times. And so that pushes your fatality rate down to like 0.5, 0.05 percent, um, which is a, so we're learning along the way. I mean, the, the good news is, I guess, again, I'm always looking for silver linings and hope, because if you don't have hope, it's kind of, um, you know, just, uh, it's dismaying. Um, but it looks like the, the, the consequences of the illness are not quite as what we feared at the beginning, which I think is also, should be reassuring. All right, and then I did have uh, one other question. Um, wanting to see if you can share, what are some uh, best safety practices for businesses to be implementing right now? Julie, well, you wanna, that's probably more up your alley. To Bill, who did you say? Julie. Oh, Julie, okay. <laughs> I thought you said Bill. <laughs> no. what, what do orthopedists know about that? <laughs> I thought maybe Darcy. Darcy, you might want to. I have some, that. but you go first. Uh, so, so safety uh, precautions in the workplace or home? Was that the question? Let's do workplace first. Yeah. Work, workplace. workplace. Um, well, I mean, as far as we know, uh, you know, there's controversy on the whole mask issue, and we'll, I guess the governor is going to tell us one way or another this week. But, um, you know, it makes sense to me that if you're sneezing or coughing, that you know, covering your cough uh, in any form is is a good idea, and uh, just to show show love for your fellow you know, humans, um, it, you know, it's a sign of uh, respect, I think, to to and, and safety, the masks probably help uh, the other person if you wear it, then, you know, because you're not coughing on them. So it's, it's that is absolutely something you should do. Um, you know, distancing yourself from people, uh, at least uh, six feet is what the, the recommended guidelines are. Um, there are people in the workplaces that wear, um, you know, the, the shields, I think that's a reasonable approach. Um, fortunately, in America, we've got lots of people that, uh, many small businesses out there that are coming up with great new ways and tools that we can protect ourselves, um, you know, in various ways. I saw a really neat one where it was a face shield connected at the bottom by a mask. So you could actually talk and not have the mask right by your face. Um, I thought that might be a great Thing for teachers to be able to, you know, feel like they can speak to their class. And can you imagine a kid in the back that has trouble hearing? You know, how are they going to hear through a mask, you know, um, 30 feet away? Um, it doesn't appear that wiping everything down meticulously really matters. You can go to the grocery store and get, you know, feel safe uh, getting your food without wiping them down in bleach. Um, because it doesn't live on the surfaces very long uh, and it doesn't appear to be living uh, outside in the hot sun uh, for more than a couple minutes. So some of those things, if you, you can feel comfortable going outside and um, enjoying the sunshine and, you know, walking the dog without wearing a mask. And uh, if you do wear a mask and you do wear gloves, you don't have to wear them in your car. I've seen lots of people driving around <laughs> with their mask all by themselves. Um, probably don't, if you do wear the mat, uh, if you do wear the gloves, I would get rid of them after you, but use them once because um, otherwise you're, you're not doing yourself any favors. So. Mm -hmm. Let me just add to what 
to what Julie said um, is, you know, businesses at least should verse themselves on the CDC and the Department of Health guidelines, um, which those can change too. Um, I know when we have, and granted we're in a little bit different situation than some um, health or even some businesses, um, if, if someone's not feeling well, it's just general rules of thumb, don't come, don't come to work. Um, of course, there's a lot of symptoms under COVID, um, so that gets a little bit difficult. Um, and usually our staff are really good about calling us first. They'll call someone on the leadership team and run through their symptoms. Um, and you know we just have to, to, to be extra vigilant here. Um, we will run through and have them stay home, but there's a lot of guidelines around when they should return to work, um, can they get an alternative diagnosis? Um, Julie's been great at getting patients in quickly or at our staff in quickly um, and um, either getting that alternative diagnosis, that's what we require for them to come work, to come back to work or a negative test. Um, then you have your positive exposure side of it, which can be very um, like going down a deep dark hole um, because then get going down, you know, okay, when should you have the test? Um, who should all stay home if there's positive exposure? Um, you, you can really, you could really chase your tail on this. Um, and that's where I think this can get really frustrating for a lot of companies because just how do you even a small business, how do you manage that? It's, it's tough for us. And I would call us, you know, some of us small to medium size, but it's, it's, it's a lot of time management from an HR standpoint. Um, and then on top of it, it it's HIPAA as well. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things to manage when you're trying to determine um, your staff coming back and coming back safely. It can be done, but just rule of thumb, if they're not feeling well, they have to stay home. But how do you manage that when, if you don't have a lot of staff? So there's just those things to think about um, when going back into it. Okay. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, again, there was a quick, another question in the chat. Um, so how are your businesses handling staff who say they have been exposed to someone who has COVID? Uh, I know it, um, some of you have addressed that or just talked about that. And uh, Dr. Weldon, you said they're self-quarantining for two weeks. Is that pretty much what everyone's doing across the board? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Unless again, people can get in and get a test. Negative test will kind of give them their get out of jail card, I guess you could call it. <laughs> In our case, if they get a negative test and are displaying no symptoms, symptoms you know, we will we will you know allow them to come back. And, and you know, again, for for all of our staff, you know, they're they're wearing a mask, and all of our patients are wearing a mask. So you know, the the risk of exposure is relatively low. Yeah, and I would say that as long as you are doing those protective measures, that seems reasonable. Um, if you are exposed, most people are getting symptoms three to eight days after um, the onset of uh, exposure. Uh, so you can keep that in mind um, mm -hmm. as you're kind of screening your, your, uh, your employees. Um, we only do uh, any infection evaluations out in their car. In fact, I just saw my partner go out and do one <laughs> right now, um, yeah, you know, to try and keep our staff less exposed, uh, to, but everybody's wearing a mask all, at all times. So I think that um, it keeps keeps the risk down. Okay. And, all right. You know, may I ask something, okay. Laura? May I bring, okay, so this is definitely chamber related because Wednesday we're having our first group session with Way Park that will be opened up and we're, it's, it, it's outdoors and we've got all of our, um, all of the requirements that the chamber is going to be requiring for in group meetings are defined now. Um, already found out that for many things, you can have all those things written and yet we put a bunch of people in a room and if a glass of wine all bets are off right nobody's wearing a mask nobody wants to wear a mask can you all hear me i just saw that my deal is unstable um and i there's some great concern there's great concern from our staff in that we don't want any of our events to possibly be a point of exposure for people for a whole lot of reasons and yet we're getting a lot of pressure from our members to come back together and 
um, do those things that Chamber is known for, especially in the networking role. So I don't know if you have any suggestions for that. As I said, the social distancing, the masking, all that is defined. And yet, when you put those people together, it's a very difficult thing to maintain or police. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I guess I would say, you know, I mean, yes, you're, you're doing the right things and, um, you know, unless, you know, you're willing to, you know, enforce the, you have to social distance, you have to wear a mask. I don't know that there's much you can do. Um, you know, as you know, you can go into some stores and they're very vigilant about enforcing the rules and others are less and less willing to enforce. So um, it really comes down to, you know, you know, people having common sense um, and, 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 you know, you're putting the rules in place and, you know, if you're willing to enforce them, you know, you're probably going to frustrate some of your members. Um, and if you're, you know, not going to enforce them, then you might frustrate some on the other side who are, are, uh, are more apt to be upset that the rules aren't being enforced. Would you like my job, Bill? <laughs> You want mine? <laughs> you can trade. Maybe that would be good. Yeah, we'll trade for a week. <laughs> one of the, one of the things like herding cats, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It is. It is. Yeah. Teresa, one of the things I've I've heard um, uh, at a, a radio uh, show was um, thinking about kind of the flow for events. You know, if are there is it going to be like a buffet line? Are there going to be certain points in an event where people just have to get close together and maybe, you know, the design of the space being such that you don't have any, any areas that'll be tightly clustered. Um, you know, and if that means changing around, you know, food or beverage or doing something like that, that could help to keep people, to keep people dispersed. Because like Bill said, I don't, I don't think people mean to cluster up. I think it just, it just happens because they're people. And in some case, they you know want to grab some food or something like that. So um, that could be helpful too. Just you know thinking about the design of the space. And I absolutely love people who say, "Well, they don't look like they have anything. <laughs> <laughs> they look okay. They look okay." Yeah. Teresa, I will tell you, I was, I was up at Lake of the Woods this weekend, and the uh, bars and restaurants up there truly don't believe in social distancing or limiting their numbers. <laughs> Where was that, Bill? Up at Lake of the Woods. Oh, you were up there? Yes. <laughs> because that's where we were supposed to go on vacation at the beginning of August and we can't get across the border. So we're postponing. Well, we something. stayed on the U.S. side. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'm, I won't be going up there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, it is about three o'clock and we will wrap this up. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming and uh, Thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. Weldon, Dr. Anderson, Bill, and Darcy. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us and answering some of these important questions that we, that we have here. Um, we will be posting this video on our website afterwards and sending it out to those that have registered. So thank you so much for everyone's involvement. Thank um, you. And, and if you know of anyone so who you think might benefit from this information, they can also access the information. So please feel free to do that. How long is that up, Laura? Um, we'll probably have it up for at least a week, maybe two weeks okay. or so. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks to our presenters. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank have you. a good day. Bye-bye.